presenting today on why identity is the new firewall. Uh, I've been in the identity management uh, space for over 20 years with uh, a few different startups, uh, one Open Network, one Oblix, uh, they were purchased, that was purchased then by uh, Oracle, um, and now I was one of the founders of Optimal IDM. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer, so sales and marketing uh, fall under me. Uh, just a little bit about Optimal IDM. We were founded in 2005. We're 100% organically grown, no outside investment, no debt. We've been profitable every year of our existence. So um, today we're going to be uh, talking about identity is the new firewall. Um, you know, breaches affecting your organization's uh, data and your customers. Uh, this is a big concern for CIOs, CTOs, um, and that's why taking full advantage of security uh, in an identity and access management solution is so crucial. So we're going to first cover uh, why identity is the, the new firewall. Um, we're going to discuss the following identity and access management components. Um, so <clears throat> authentication versus authorization, the differences between single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and adaptive authentication, uh, how giving uh, the right access to the right people at the right time is so crucial, crucial and how a unified view of all identity data is, is important. And then finally, we're gonna cover uh, the, some criteria that you should look at uh, when choosing an identity and access management solution. So um, not that long ago, um, everything really within an organization was completely 100% on-premise and all sat behind the corporate firewall. Uh, corporate IT was very centralized and they kept all that data uh, secure and protected behind the firewall. Cloud computing didn't exist, right? So everything, all servers, all desktops, everything was behind that. Um, and even if an employee needed to uh, access that corporate network from home, they would VPN into, into the corporate network. Um, so things were easy, I'd say, uh, security uh, and safety uh, behind that corporate firewall. Um, but Cybersecurity now is one of the toughest challenges in the IT industry. Um, we hear of it all the time, uh, certainly on a monthly basis, but often on a weekly basis of how yet another company had a data breach, they were infected, whether that's malware, whether that was just a breach of the data. We sort of become numb to it though. It's a very common occurrence. Um, so we'll cover some of those factors of how that can uh, be mitigated. So we really no longer live uh, you know, behind the safety and security of that corporate firewall. We don't have that protection anymore. Um, more and more companies, even the most conservative companies, uh, have come around and started using SaaS-based applications, right? So software as a service, uh, that hybrid mode, uh, cloud-based applications, whichever way you kind of talk to it. Um, this puts that corporate data, uh, as well as logins potentially, outside of that firewall, right? So if you use a CRM system, uh, you may have a separate username and password into that application. Uh, hopefully you're using a different password, um, but you may uh, also be putting that data, your corporate data within that company. Um, and you're trusting that that company will secure and protect your data. So this definitely leads to some additional challenges. So this is really the shift to cloud computing, the internet of things, mobile, tablets, uh, bring your own device, right? You may use your personal iPad at home to access uh, the corporate data. Um, all of these really put these things into uh, individual per, uh, perimeters that now need to be protected. So you need to protect that CRM system separately from your email, from your other applications. So this really does bring the shift to identity, you itself, as being the new firewall. So we now need to be, instead of reactionary, uh, we must be uh, proactive and we must uh, as that activity is uh, occurring and, uh, and, and happening. So we really have what I call the, the intersection of people, devices, and applications. So uh, you uh, being the person that's gonna authenticate, but what device are you authenticating? Is, you, is it your personal bring your own device, uh, iPad, or is it a corporate managed device? And then what application are you going to? So depending upon the person authenticating, what type of device and what app would dictate the security? Uh, if you're on a corporate owned device behind the firewall, perhaps security will be lower and I wouldn't do multi-factor. Uh, if you're at home, outside the corporate network on your own personal device, now maybe to access that same application, I'm going to require multi-factor to make sure uh, it's further secured. So, um, 
to make matters worse, just beyond that application, that now we're no longer inside that firewall, we're out here, uh, it's, it, it's open. Um, some studies, uh, a McAfee study found that 80% of respondents admit to using non-approved applications. So gone are the days when IT approved all the applications, they put them behind the firewall, and, and you only could use the applications that IT had vetted. Now, 80% are using, they're just spinning it up, um, whether that's a, a CRM system that they just choose to do, marketing, uh, grabbing some application that they want to use, uh, they're not going through IT to get that approved. The analyst firm, uh, Gartner, predicts that 35% of enterprise IT expenditures will be outside of the corporate budget. Pretty, pretty, pretty large number, actually. Um, so we, we have a bit of what I'd call the wild, wild west. Um, IT kind of has lessened uh, their role within this. Uh, the individual uh, budgets uh, groups are, are doing their, uh, their own thing. So I say, how do we deal with this new reality? Uh, well, one of the first things that can help um, is technology and, and standards. So federation can help. So federation is the concept where you would log in with your corporate credentials uh, to your internal Active Directory and access that application. So whether that's Salesforce or Concur for expenses, you wouldn't have a separate username and password within that organization. You would use your corporate credentials. So that can help a little bit. Um, so rather than spreading that around, we would set up that federated trust to a Salesforce Concur box and, and do that on open standards such as SAML. Um, that assertion, of course, is past the app. So where we come here is looking kind of at the legacy. So legacy environment, it was on-premise. It was very much proprietary, browser-only, single domain. Um, to where you're looking at the current uh, infrastructure, uh, hybrid, SaaS, uh, cloud, uh, open standards, uh, browser, but not only just browsers, now you have APIs, Internet of Things, you have to secure those APIs, and it's federated trust. So it's a whole new um, environment that we're really dealing with here. So first we're gonna cover really the, uh, the authentication versus authorization, right? So authentication is the process of proving you are who you say you are, whether that's username and password, a uh, CAC card like I'm showing here, digital certificates. You can authenticate in many ways, but it's, it's the process of proving you are who you say you are. And authorization is the process of allowing or denying a user uh, access to an application or resource uh, based on your rules that you've set up, whether that's uh, based on a group or a role, based on being in a, in a given department, um, but you're going to authorize or deny uh, access uh, to a user. So um, beyond federation, um, which can help certainly, um, how does identity firewalling work? So one concept that can help is, is what's known as adaptive authentication and authorization. Um, so what that is, is it's with this, the authentication or authorization changes based on those factors. So uh, as I mentioned before, you know, what application are you going to? Uh, what is your role within the app? The time of the day. So perhaps, you know, Monday through Friday, eight to five doesn't require multi-factor. Outside of that window, we're gonna step up or do adaptive authorization to require uh, multi-factor. I need an additional source to prove uh, this to further vet you. Uh, maybe your geographic location. So if, if you're in the US, I'm not gonna do it. If you're outside of the US, if I'm in a US corporation, I'm gonna require that. On the corporate network or on a corporate managed device, I may lessen the security uh, on that because I know I've already hardened the device. Um, so th these are really key uh, to doing um, the adaptive authentication and authorization is key uh, based contextually about the user. So it's not just the user authenticating anymore, but it's those other items. Um, so this can be either static or dynamic policies that can be configured to, to do those. Uh, given the example here that I mentioned, the Monday through Friday, you know, eight to five, um, that access should be guaranteed. Perhaps you don't even allow access to the application outside of those windows, um, but these can be very, um, scripted for you. Um, so care also should be given that you only provide access to the right people at the right time. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, well, you can use features such as delegated administration um, to push this administration down to an administrator. So 
you know, corporate IT, as I mentioned, it lessens their role. Now pushing it out to the individual departments to say, you know what, the head of engineering, the head of marketing, you choose which of your folks should have access to the given application. Me here in corporate IT, I, I don't know. I don't know your people. I don't know their roles within your departments. So I'm going to push that administration down to you and allow you as a, the local administrator, you have greater access and, and, and closer uh, ties to those employees. You're going to govern and give them access to the application rather than corporate IT. Um, along, that, uh, along these routes, you should also do periodic audits just to uh, ensure that the, the access is correct. Um, and that's also known as uh, attestation. So again, you could push that to that delegated administrator and require them to do attestation. Um, they have to go in and actually attest that, yes, Mike needs access to this, Matt needs access to this, rather than just leaving it dormant over time. Um, and along with that, if, if uh, you should consider a full governance solution. So there's governance, uh, there's kind of a, a niche within identity and access management that's all around governance and making sure that people have the right access to the right applications and a governance solution um, can help with that. So we talked about uh, MFA and how that can um, help. So these are some of the, the common uh, items that are, are available within multi-factor. So uh, emailing of a one-time password, um, a one-time password via SMS or text, uh, as well as voice. So the voice would actually call a landline or a cell phone and give you a code over the phone. Uh, TOTP is a standard, uh, it's time-based one-time password. Um, Microsoft has an authenticator app called Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator. We have one as well, the Optimal Authenticator. Um, so TOTP, what it is, is app on, on your phone or on your uh, computer, and it's a rolling code. So that code is good for 60 seconds. Um, it will then um, go from red or from green to yellow to red, indicating you'll get a new code. Um, so when you type that in, you type in your password along with this code, um, it then checks and does a, a server check if it's done within that time frame, which is when it, when it turns uh, yellow to red. Um, if it matches the algorithm, then you've authenticated with that. So it's an open standard um, used across many, many applications. Um, but then you can also do push. So what a push is, is it's even better than um, TOTP in the sense that's uh, disjointed between the server and the client. Uh, with push, the server is actually pushing a message, so you've, uh, you've pre-registered your device, and it's pushing a code to your cell phone, uh, to your device. Um, and then depending upon how your device is configured, maybe that's you click an approve or deny message when it pushes it to you, um, or maybe fingerprint or facial recognition uh, as well. So one of the things when we talk about multi-factor is it's definitely more secure, but normally you're also now making it less easy for your end user, right? You're making it harder for your end user because they're not just typing their username and password. Now they're having to go through this extra hoop. Um, so the fingerprint and the facial recognition in particular um, can be very um, helpful in making it less, uh, making it friction, less friction uh, for the end user. Um, you can also do things such as native uh, REST APIs, uh, RADIUS. Um, one of the other ones, um, in gaining ground is, is biometrics. So that's uh, basically um, the behavior of your typing. So as you type in your password, uh, even if uh, Matt had my password and he typed in my username and password and it was the correct password, he types the password differently than I type it. So when you've made it with the software and you've registered your typing pattern, um, it now recognizes that it's truly me typing in that password as opposed to somebody else. Um, you can also do that with continuous authentication. So as the user is still using their application periodically, that's actually still checking to make sure it's still me behind the keyboard. So very, very cool technology. And, and we're getting it to the point where passwords are starting to be eliminated, right? So uh, we may be able to use, you know, the push or uh, the facial recognition as opposed to a password to access the applications. We all know that passwords are difficult to deal with. Um, but with that, multi-factor can also um, be stored for a certain period of time. So this is the concept that I'm accessing um, the given application. Maybe I'm on my, my Apple, I'm in the, the Safari application, and I access the application. Well, we can store that 
for a period of time. Uh, you know, so maybe if, if I access the same application tomorrow, uh, same browser, same IP location, everything about that is the same, well, don't require the multi-factor. So that's a common thing that you can do to still have the, the security that it is the same person, the same browser, the same user, um, but we're not gonna uh, make them do multi-factor again. So with that, malware is definitely a big problem within IT security. Um, and it's easily spread via these phishing attacks. So from the execution front, they're gonna attack, whether that's a fish or a bait, um, they're attempting to gain credentials on that computer, uh, do a kernel exploit, malware, and have it spread across multiple uh, computers within the enterprise. Um, so what are they after? What are these, uh, these folks looking for? Well, it, I mean, it could be data theft. They're actually looking for your corporate data and they wanna steal that corporate data. Um, espionage and ransom, right? So the, there's many reports of the ransomwares. Uh, they're going to require, and there was one down uh, in Florida where I live, that they uh, totally took over all the computers and the, that county government was going to pay the ransomware um, to the uh, to the hackers uh, to get access back to their data. They had no access to their servers or data. Um, or just business disruption. They're looking to do corporate espionage and, and, and just uh, cause business disruption. Um, so according to a 2015 Verizon data breach report, they said that if an attacker sends an email to 100 people in your company, that 23 people will open it, 11 people will open and click on the attachment, and six are going to do this within the first hour. That's a staggering uh, figure and one that should definitely be concerned. So what are the, some of the things that we can do to kind of help with that? We'll cover in a, in a minute. So uh, unfortunately, if the attacker is successful, it takes about 24 to 48 hours before the attacker obtains complete ownership of the enterprise. Spreads quickly. If, if the malware is written correctly, unfortunately, uh, it's going to be a quick and, and, and uh, lethal uh, hit. It typically takes uh, a lot of times, if it was Trojan malware, about three to six months before a business detects this. Um, this has happened with a lot of retailers. They were breached, um, we'll mention them, but they're out there. They were breached and, and infected for many, many months before they realized it. Uh, during that time period, uh, people's credit card information was being compromised and sent to the, uh, the attackers. Um, if it's not Trojan, then you typically know about it pretty quickly. Um, and actually, always, good in a way to know some customers examples. So one of our customers, this happened to them. Um, a, a user um, clicked on an attachment and very, very quickly, took about a day, less than a day, but they noticed it started hitting servers. All of their servers were compromised with this uh, malware. Totally took over the servers, did want them to pay a ransom. Um, as kind of depicted by this diagram, we actually had servers that were VPN into the company uh, our servers were not affected because we don't open up the other ports that are normally open on most servers. But this is this falls into the category, if you ask this customer, you know, would this happen to me? They, of course, would have said no. The answer is it can. So you really need to take cybersecurity seriously and use methods to make sure that employees are careful about that. We'll cover that here in a second, some of the things that you can um, educate your customers on what to do. So this was a user who did, just according to that Verizon report, they opened the email, they clicked on the attachment, and then it quickly spread, and, and now they were infected across the entire company. Um, now this company actually did restores of their servers, and they restored um, all of the data and all of the servers and in their infrastructure. So, um, you know, another example that we had from a customer, um, the user called our, our help desk, they thought they'd been fished. Um, so sure enough, they actually had. Um, looking at the audit logs, uh, we could see that the user, that same user ID was logging in both at the same time from the United States and from Africa. Well, that's pretty hard to do unless you're you know, VPN into a server over there. Um, this particular customer only operates in the US. So going back to those rules that I talked about, authentication and authorization rules, we added an authentication rule to their service to only allow for authentication to occur within the United States. Now, reality, going back to that being uh, not reactionary, but pro proactive, 
this should have been added up front, right? They knew that they only had users uh, in the in the U.S. and that this shouldn't happen outside. Unfortunately, like many customers, they, they rolled to production quickly. They needed to be there yesterday, um, so it did, didn't get added. But this is where going back to like those audits on the delegated administration, and we talked about audits of, of who should be there. Periodically, you should look at your rules, go through and do a health check to say, does this make sense? Do we need to add any extra uh, authentication or authorization rules to our system? So you need to do a self-assessment uh, occasionally to make sure, and again, be proactive, not reactive to that. Um, so what else can we do really to protect ourselves uh, from the malware? Um, one of the first, uh, go back to the technology, the email service. Most email services, if you're using a cloud-based one, so take like Office 365, it does have malware protection built into the service. So it's gonna detect some of those, automatically put those into a spam. It's never gonna show up into your inbox. Um, how good is it? Well, you know, they're always making it better and better, but the uh, unfortunately, the bad guys are always uh, getting better and better as well. But definitely look for an email service that has that. You can also put internal controls on that. Um, many of you may have seen, you know, where you use a service that warns emails coming externally. So <clears throat> when you receive an email from somebody externally, it's, it puts a footer on the bottom, you know, warning, be careful about, you know, responding to this email. This is coming from an external entity. That can be a helpful um, warning to individual. Um, also instruct those users uh, of what to look for in the emails and the warning signs. Uh, we'll cover that in a little bit too. Uh, have antivirus. Sounds like a simple thing, but certainly have antivirus installed on the corporate devices. You can't really help the end users that are using that uh, you know, personal device, the BYOD, tablet, iPad, but uh, on any of the corporate devices, certainly have the antivirus. Um, so some signs of a phishing email. What should you look for if you see a, an email that might look suspicious? What are the types of things that you would look for? Um, one, where the email from, quote unquote, is not the actual recipient. So you may get one from, you know, admin, and it says uh, Office 365, but then it says at some other domain.com. Um, that should, you know, raise your eyebrow to say, wait a minute, this isn't actually coming from Microsoft. It, it says Office 365 at some other domain. Um, looking at the links. Um, so it may say, hey, you need to change your password. That's a common one they'll do. So they're trying to get you to go to their page, enter your current username and password and quote unquote change your password when in fact they're just doing that to get your username and password. Um, so look for those types of things where you haven't asked to change your password. You shouldn't get an email uh, with a link to change your password if you didn't click that and, and, and proactively do that. Uh, a common one as well, spelling your grammatical errors. Uh, you'll see that quite commonly in, in those, although they're getting better and better about uh, looking for that. But look for the grammar in particular. Spelling is a lot easier. They're able to put that through spell checks. But uh, if the grammar is poor, uh, it may be a phishing attack. Uh, as I said, they're getting better and better with that. Um, so now let's look at some other items uh, in terms of identity and access management. So identity data. So the identity data within a company uh, can exist in, in many different repositories. So uh, obviously common one, Active Directory, uh, that's your typically your, your source of authentication and your main uh, LDAP repository, but you could have other LDAP directories as well. Many companies set up a, a corporate LDAP where they also have other data that they're storing. Um, SQL databases, other systems, HR, Salesforce, Concur. Um, so there are other sources of identity um, data that does exist, whether in the corporate enterprise or outside, um, that should be used as a part of authentication and authorization. So being able to pull the information together. So take, take the HR. There may be data that's in HR that is not um, included in your active directory, right? Um, that could be important information that we want to, to do, um, pay grade, something like that. So pulling this data together um, as a part of your identity infrastructure is important. Um, so technologies can help, uh, whether that's a virtual directory or meta directory. Um, virtual directories will pull that data from these different disparate data sources uh, in real time, right? So it's got a real time connection to AD, to SQL databases, um, where meta directories do the opposite, they'll synchronize the data from all those different repositories uh, into a common directory. The pros and cons, 
Uh, virtual directories, well, it's going to do that in real time, right? So it's it's not going to have a latency problem. Um, the problem with the the uh, the meta directory is there is a latency to the data that you have. So when we look to selecting that identity management platform, um, we, we see here the cybersecurity is key as well. What should you look for? Well, the first real item that normally comes up is, am I looking for an on-premise solution or, or a cloud base? Um, so with an on-premise identity management platform, you know, your staff would do the installation, configuration, and maintenance, right? So one, it's going to require knowing some expertise about that application. They may need to go to training um, to do that, but they're going to do the installation, configuration, and ongoing maintenance of that. Um, does your staff have the expertise? So take a look at Federation Technologies. Uh, one that's gaining ground is the OAuth standard. So we talked about SAML before. OAuth is taking uh, off uh, really rapidly. Does your staff have the expertise in, expertise in OAuth to be able to do that? And that's a common um, need that you would need. Um, do they have the time as well, right? They're off doing other uh, jobs right now. Do they have the time to manage, maintain uh, the platform itself? So you certainly want to do this. Um, back to the standards. I mentioned, you know, SAML and OAuth. We've also seen many um, applications that say they support a given standard like SAML, uh, when in fact they don't. Um, because, you know, per SAML, the order of the assertion should, shouldn't matter. We've definitely seen many applications where email needs to be the first item in the assertion. Um, well, that's not really supporting the SAML spec. Um, so that's another thing that you have to look to if you're looking at your staff managing and maintaining a, a solution. Um, so the other option, of course, is, is cloud-based solutions. So a cloud-based solution, um, oddly enough, even though they're cloud-based, so they're hosting the platform itself, um, oftentimes with a cloud-based solution, your staff is still going to need to manage a large part of it by adding the new applications, adding the certificates, uh, setting up the endpoints. Um, so the good news with the, a lot of the cloud-based solutions is, is you know, the, the infrastructure for managing and maintaining the large part of it and keeping that service up and running uh, doesn't fall to your staff, your staff still is going to need to do some some part of that and manage it. And with that, no, need to know the standards. So they're still going to need to know the OAuth um, you know, standard, the SAML standards to be able to manage and maintain that. There certainly are other services where they're more of a concierge type service to take that over. Um, so then with this, you know, do you want a public or a shared platform, private or dedicated? So uh, what I mean by that is, is with the public shared platform, uh, you and, and other customers are all running on the same hardware. Um, with a private and dedicated model, uh, it's private dedicated servers um, that just your company would be running on. Um, take Microsoft. Microsoft used to do this uh, with uh, prior to O365, Office 365, it was called BPOS, Business Productivity Online Service. Well, they also offered a BPOS D or dedicated. So some of the largest Fortune 500 customers were on that BPOS D dedicated. They had dedicated servers and dedicated personnel hosting and managing that platform. Microsoft doesn't offer that anymore. Uh, they kind of wanted to get out of that. Um, but that is what, what uh, some companies out there offer. Um, so with a public or a shared platform, you know, you can have some degradations, um, service up interruptions that actually aren't caused by you, it's caused by other customers, right? And so because you're running on the same hardware, um, you could see degradation in, you know, in particular, one of your most mission critical applications, which is email, right? If email goes down, the company is uh, is, is out of business. Um, so that's something uh, definitely to, to take a look at with the platform. Um, do patches, updates, new features, do they happen automatically to the service? Um, that's something that you want to take a look at. Are you notified in advance of that happening? Um, with a private dedicated, you could potentially have periods where you ask the vendor to shut down and not do patches or updates, right? So if you're a retail customer, uh, you're looking at, um, you know, Black Friday through Christmas, you, you don't want patches or updates to happen. Uh, you want to keep everything other than critical patches. You want everything just uh, the way it is. Let's roll out new features uh, after after Christmas uh, during that time. So that's pretty common. Um, so then you also want to look at the vendor itself. You know, are they financially viable? Um, are they public? Are they profitable? Um, I know one company, and I won't mention them, but uh, you know, read their 10Q if they're public. I read one, and woof, 
the company is taken in millions. They're a multi-million dollar company. They've taken in multi-millions, went public. They're still bleeding cash. Uh, their 10Q is very, very uh, cautionary. Um, so are they going to make it? You know, do you want to put yourself into that? Um, whereas other companies that are public and quite profitable, you can take a look, look at a Microsoft, very, very solid standing. You're not expecting Microsoft uh, to go out of business anytime soon. It certainly can happen. You look at things like Lehman Brothers, but you want to do some vetting of the vendor that you're going to choose. Um, breadth of the service, right? So, you know, what does the vendor offer? Are they offering just single sign-on and, and um in that or do they offer other things such as multi-factor um, many times customers want to use um, a vendor that has both right so that they don't have to go to another vendor for multi-factor it's a whole lot easier if the service has the single sign-on and the multi-factor and reporting and auditing all built in uh, to one same with the uh, the features such as the adaptive authentication authorization right there are niche vendors that offer just that capability to do step up or is it built into the service of the vendor itself? Most people want, you know, one place to go, one-stop shopping. Um, and then I, I, I always put this one is, is, does the vendor have customers similar to you? So say you're in the insurance industry, do they have other insurance, you know, financial? Uh, are they pharmaceutical? Do they have other pharma customers? Um, that knows, because there, there are niches between industries um, that they may have uh, feature individual features that that meet your needs. So you certainly want to take take a look at that. Um, look to the analysts, right? Um, so there there's multiple analyst firms out there. Um, you know they all say a little bit different, but uh, certainly take a look at what the analysts have to say um, about the given solution. Um, security, right? If you're storing your data, whether this is with an IAM platform or even the Salesforce concurs does that company do audits, right? So SOC 2, ISO 27001, uh, do they have, and that's just really, it's not the end all be all, but it at least knows that an independent firm has come in, audited them, looked for the pro proper uh, controls and processes in place to secure your data. Um, if they don't have those audits, you, you might wanna be uh, pretty suspect of, of them for that. Um, do they support the initiatives like GDPR? So GDPR initiative uh, in Europe, um, but many firms are uh, still held to that, right? So that's the, the data protection clauses around that. Um, so, you know, do they support that GDPR? Do they support those initiatives as well? So I hope um, that this has given a good background around um, how identity is the new firewall and how and some of the methods that we can use uh, to further protect and secure the data as well as look at the, the individual vendors. Um, we're now going to open it up for a q and uh, I think questions were probably coming in as uh, I was speaking and so we'll uh, take the next few minutes for a little Q&A. And I thank you all for attending. <laughs>